This is the Economic Club of Florida, a distinguished platform for discussion of the major national issues of the day. On today's program, former U.S. Treasury Secretary Jacob Liu on the role of government and fiscal policy in the economic recovery from the coronavirus. I think we're seeing now a year later uh, that when you bring all the instruments of government to bear, it makes a big difference. Good day and welcome to the 543rd in our series of Distinguished Speaker Programs. I'm Harvey Bennett for the Economic Club of Florida. We're delighted to have with us today former U.S. Treasury Secretary Jacob Liu. Jacob, welcome. Good to be with you, Harvey. You're not only a former Treasury Secretary under President Obama, but you also served as Director of the Office of Management and Budget under Presidents Clinton and Obama, and you later became President Obama's Chief of Staff. With that inside knowledge, when you first learned of the seriousness of the coronavirus here in the U.S. last year, what were your first thoughts? Well, one of the things that you handle as OMB director is crisis management, um, because almost every crisis requires resources for a response and ultimately uh, to make things right. So whether it's a horrible terrorist attack like the Oklahoma City bombings or a forest fire that destroys a community or a hurricane, you're right in the thick of things. That also applies to pandemics. Um, Now, we would never had anything of the scale of COVID, but I had had to deal with things, you know, like uh, Ebola. And um, the, the, the first thing you have to do is get your hands around the science, get your hands around the delivery systems, understand the gap and apply all the resources of government to dealing with it as quickly as possible. My first instinct was this was bigger than anything that I had seen, and it would take an enormous effort uh, to get that done. Um, And I think we're seeing now a year later uh, that when you bring all the instruments of government to bear, it makes a big difference. As we record this in late 2021, the U.S. and especially Florida are well into the recovery stage uh, from the coronavirus. Tell us a little bit about what you're going to share with our club today. So we're going to talk about uh, the state of the economy uh, and uh, our, our, how life has changed uh, be- during COVID uh, and what we can expect after Um, There's a lot of uncertainty about the future because we've never gone through uh, something quite like this. And, um, you know, we'll be talking about whether the response uh, has been uh, appropriate and when it uh, can be considered uh, to be successful. Uh, And uh, we'll we'll talk about the global situation, uh, how uh, the situation in the United States is different from the situation around the world. I'm sure we'll touch on a few other topics as well. Now, today you're a managing partner of a private equity firm based in New York. In that role, what is your view of Florida and its economy? Look, Florida has a diverse economy. Um, It's got a growing population. uh, And uh, in so many ways, it's an attractive place uh, to do business. Um, You know, the the attraction uh, of Florida uh, for for its weather uh, has brought a lot of people uh, from uh, other places and uh, its it's attractiveness as as an environment to do business as as well. Um, I think the the, challenge for Florida is very much like the challenge for the rest of the country, uh, getting through this crisis so that people can be confident that uh, it's under control and it will stay under control and that if there's a path ahead that has some surprises, which we have to be ready for, that Florida will be ready to deal with it. And, um, you know, I think, you know, each state is going to be judged uh, based on not just how it dealt with the first wave uh, or the second wave, but uh, how ready it is to deal with future crises. From its history with hurricanes, you know, Florida has demonstrated great resilience um, and uh, uh, hopefully coming out of this uh, health crisis and this economic crisis, it will also demonstrate uh, resilience uh, on the health front as well. Jacob Liu, thank you, sir, 
We look forward to hearing your formal remarks and learning more about Recovering from the COVID-19 Shock, the Economic and Policy Outlook. Good to be with you, Harvey. Now, here's John Bradley, Senior Investment Advisor with the Florida State Board of Administration, with our formal introduction. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker and our moderator for today's program. I'll start with our moderator, someone we all know well, our former club president and chairman, Ash Williams. Ash is currently executive director and CIO of the State Board of Administration of Florida and is responsible for managing approximately $235 billion in assets, including those of the Florida Retirement System, the fifth largest public pension fund in the United States. Prior to joining the SBA, Ash was a managing director at Fir Tree Partners and president and CEO of Schroeder Capital Management. Ash currently chairs the Council of Institutional Investors, the Managed Funds Association's Institutional Investor Advisory Council, and the Alternative Investor Forum's Investor Board. He also serves as trustee of the National Institute for Public Finance and the Florida State University Foundation. We thank you, Ash, for joining us this afternoon. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest for today's program, Jack Liu. Jack is currently managing partner at Lindsay Goldberg, a New York-based private equity firm, and a member of the faculty at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Prior to Lindsey Goldberg, Jack served as the 76th United States Secretary of the Treasury from 2013 to 2017. Prior to serving as Treasury Secretary, Jack served as President Obama's Chief of Staff, as well as Director of the Office of Management and Budget under Presidents Obama and Clinton. Jack is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the National Academy of Social Insurance, and of the Bar in Massachusetts in the District of Columbia. Jack, we are thankful to have you with us today, and I'll now turn it over to Ash and Jack Liu. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for being with us. Good to see you, Ash, and uh, thank you, John, for the nice introduction. Indeed. Thank you, John. So why don't we uh, get into it? I, our audience, I'm sure, has a number of questions uh, that are right up your alley of expertise. And I think we could frame the discussion broadly in a couple of different areas. First of all, we've seen a number of unprecedented events over the past 12 or 15 months. We've seen courtesy of a pandemic that in and of itself was unprecedented in modern history. We've seen a global simulta simultaneous shutdown of economies followed by a reopening we've seen the most violent one of the most violent collapses in market values followed by an equally violent recovery in market values in history and as part of coping with that disruption of the uh, globe global economies in the u.s economy we've seen very accommodative monetary policy from central banks in the U.S. and around the world. And now we're starting to see successive waves, or we've been seeing successive waves of accommodative fiscal policy as well, which brings to my mind two general categories I think people are interested in. The first and most obvious tangent to central bank policy is interest rates. Interest rates touch everyone's lives in a number of ways we all understand. So maybe if you could provide us a little perspective on how you see the interest rate environment on a going forward basis. And then the second thing that would relate to the combination of accommodative monetary and fiscal policy would be the potential for inflation. There were powerful inflation expectations after the great financial crisis, and many expected to see hyperinflation as a consequence of these same central bank and, and um, fiscal policies at the time. It never materialized. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about the interplay of interest rates and inflation. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Ash. Um, I think the thing about uh, where we are now uh, in this particular economic crisis is we have to remember how it has been driven by the health crisis, because that has a lot to do with both where we are and potentially where we're going. Uh, we've never in our lifetime seen this kind of uh, health-driven economic crisis, a global shutdown, as you say, and uh, opening up the global economy um, is a complicated piece of business. Um, obviously, the response by monetary authorities and fiscal policymakers has been dramatic, and I think we only get to run the tape one way. We saw how 
the crisis evolves with that kind of support. And we're seeing the very likely emergence from the crisis with a healthy economy in the United States and in many other places. So I think that's a testimony to the effectiveness of the response. Um, if, if we were coming out of this uh, crisis without that, I don't think we would be looking at the projected growth rates that we're seeing or the projected declines in unemployment. Now, going into the, the uh, health and economic crisis, you know, we were in the 10th year of an economic growth uh, period. Uh, you know, there was not a huge amount of pressure on interest rates. It was not a highly inflationary environment. There was a lot of discussion at the time about you know, the impact of aging of populations and uh, dampened demand being a long-term drag on economic growth. So before we went into the COVID crisis, the concern was how do we get back to anything approaching a, a normal interest rate, normal inflation rate, uh, and long-term growth? Um, Taking interest rates down to zero was part of the monetary policy response, I think an appropriate policy response. Um, you know, from the perspective of the US uh, monetary authorities, the Fed has been very clear that they are not moving quickly either on interest rates or to change their uh, quantitative easing policies until they're confident that we're really out of the crisis. Now, what does that mean? Uh, does it mean that if we have one month of uh, higher economic activity or uh, the, you know, some hints of inflation that the Fed's going to jump in an instant? I don't think so. You know, the speech that uh, Chairman Powell gave uh, last summer that he's reiterated in many communications is that to average 2% interest over time, which is the goal, 2% inflation over time, which is the goal of the Fed, you have to have it be above 2% at some points because we've gone through a long period of time where it was below 2%. So I think if you see inflation you know, bumping into the mid twos and even into the threes, I don't think the Fed is going to have an instantaneous response to throw the brakes on. Now, what does the interest rate look like long-term? We don't really know coming out of this crisis. You know, there was a period of time, you know, five years ago, when there was a serious debate about whether the normal long-term interest rate had been moving and was no longer 4%, you know, for long-term treasuries, but would be 3%. You know, I still think that that's not a, a, a ridiculous number to have in mind is what a normal long-term interest rate is. The Fed doesn't make long-term interest rate decisions. The Fed makes short-term interest rate decisions the market makes long-term interest rate decisions. So then the question of inflation starts to play in, in terms of how the market is pricing in long-term prospects for inflation. I think if you unpack what's going on right now, we have a number of things that are likely to lead to at least um, sporadic uh, increases in inflation. You know, we've seen a long period of supply interruptions because of economies being shut down. We're seeing a backlog on shipping with ports that have waiting, you know, long waiting periods for container ships to come in. We didn't need to have an accident in the Suez Canal on top of that. Um, and we also have pent up demand from all of us being in uh, somewhat unusual circumstances, many of us remote for the, over a year. So there's going to be things that are happening that will be transitory. The Fed, I think, is of the view, as public statements reflect, that the transitory impact will come and it will go, and that's not the basis for a monetary policy response. Now, they have to be on the alert to what are longer-term uh, inflationary pressures. And I think you know, the thing they normally look at is pressure on labor costs, wage pressure, and uh, the like. Um, we haven't seen a lot of that. We're seeing some areas of shortage of labor, but we still have eight and a half million people who are out of work uh, and employable. Um, it's going to take a good while to draw down those numbers. Where we will see an issue is if we have a mismatch of skills. And we can talk later, perhaps, about some of the ways to address that. That skills mismatch was an issue before COVID as well. 
Um, and I think we do have a challenge to make sure that we have sufficient um, workforce uh, skills to meet the jobs we need. But you know, whether or not we're going to see long-term wage pressure, I'll say one more thing on that. If one is concerned about um, dealing with some of the underlying issues in the economy about uh, inequality in income and, and wealth, um, a little bit of wage inflation is not a bad thing. You know, having wages go up is the only way to get real wage growth. So it's a question of degree. Is it going to be at the point where it pushes us into an inflationary spiral, or will it be something that can be absorbed? And you know, coming out of a once-in-a-lifetime economic crisis, anyone who thinks they know for sure what the answer to that is, is getting ahead of themselves. And we're just going to have to watch the data over a period of time. It seems reasonable. And to your point of the combination of pent-up demand and constrained supply leading to short-term pressure on prices, the long-term demographics are still not terribly friendly to rampant inflation. We have organic birth rates in most industrialized nations at or below replacement rates, the U.S. included, and that just doesn't bode well for household formation or all the consumption that goes with that. So I, I suspect you're exactly right. There's a transient phenomenon here, undetermined as to its length and extremity, but the longer term would seem to be some sort of reversion to a norm of a relatively slow growth environment. Yeah. One of the things we know that you know, for sure is that uh, indigenous demographics uh, take a you know, generation to change. Uh, so it's not something you can turn a switch. Then there are immigration issues where, you know, particularly for high skilled workers, you know, there are issues that um, become uh, very real. Um, you know, I think these issues are, it's premature for us to kind of know where we are post COVID, but we had those concerns going in. And I rather suspect we're going to face those same concerns coming out. Right. I suspect there's a productivity element involved in this as well. If we think about the way we're doing this meeting right now and think of the adaptations so many businesses and individuals have made in their prior routines because of COVID, some of those I suspect will be more durable changes that may boost productivity uh, and may boost productivity of uh, profitability of, of businesses. Uh, I wonder what role that plays in things. Uh, certainly that could be friendly to growth going forward and it may help uh, extend the, the value per unit of labor consumed. So I actually think we're going to end up with a, a response that's hybrid going forward. Um, uh, you know, speaking for myself, uh, I don't think there's any substitute for in-person contact to really get to know and understand the people you're dealing with. There's so many signals that you don't get over uh, the screen um, that you do get when you're meeting with people in person. On the other hand, you know, I think the likelihood is that people are not going to travel 15 hours for a one-hour meeting, knowing full well that you can get 70% of the way there you know, over a Zoom. So I think it will be mixed. I suspect the impact on the economy will also be mixed. There will be uh, improvements in productivity in some places if uh, we all manage to do 10 or 20 percent more because we're not uh, spending as much time getting from here to there. That ought to show up in, in the productivity of what we do. But it'll be a negative uh, in the, in the you know, hospitality industry and in the transportation industry. Um, and it will free up space where we don't know what comes to fill that space. You know, perhaps leisure activity will fill some of the business travel activity. If you're running a, an airline, substituting leisure for business is not one for one because the cost of business travel uh, at the last minute is very different than the, the price of leisure travel that's long planned in advance. So I think the economic you know, effects will flow through different industries in different ways. I think there's a pent up demand to get back to normal and there will be probably a period of kind of resuming more normal activity. And then I think it will equilibrate. Um, you know, uh, I, I'd never done a Zoom until uh, 13 months ago and now a day doesn't go by when I don't spend more hours in front of the screen uh, than, than I care to count. Um, but I'll be happy when I'm not staring at the screen uh, for so many hours a day.
I'm with you on that. We've had a couple of audience questions come in that take us back to the question of central bank policy and uh, monetary stimulus. So the questions are, are twofold. First of all, uh, what is your feeling of the uh, cumulative and longer term impact of QE? Um, and secondly, on the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet, uh, how, how do you see implications uh, of increased deficits, et cetera, for the economy going forward? But I, I, I think um, the, the, the size of the balance sheet is kind of staggering when you just look at the numbers, but um, it, I think the Fed has shown a, a great deal of ability to manage it, to not have sudden moves that send shockwaves through uh, financial markets. So markets kind of ask the question, when are they going to move? Because markets try to speed up um, the impact to put in current prices, what's going to happen over a long period of time. The Fed tends to look far over the horizon. Where do we want to be in a year, in two years, in three years? And the challenge, I think, will be communication. Um, because everything that the Fed says when there's a change has huge ramifications domestically and internationally as markets absorb uh, and bring forward the impact of the change. It's going to be a challenge. I think um, Chairman Powell has done an outstanding job you know, communicating, not without some stumbles. You can't be in this kind of a place without having to go back and, and sometimes say something again. But I think you know, we've, we've seen you know, really over the last 10 years, the Fed you know, kind of fine tuning how it, uh, it, it speaks. What I've been kind of surprised uh, about is that markets try to get ahead of the Fed. And I think that it makes a lot of sense to listen to the Fed because they don't make their decision based on what they're seeing on a Bloomberg screen. They look at analyses and studies that they are working on for months and years, and uh, they don't make decisions impulsively. Uh, so I think they actually say what they mean. Now, situation can change. If we ended up where they saw the likelihood of an inflationary spiral, they would have to communicate that and then move into a new set of policies. But I don't think you'd see them turn on a dime in a way that would, certainly their goal would be not to cause undue disruption to markets. I think if you look at the interventions they made during the COVID crisis, we're, we don't hear the story of the crises averted. But there were many moments during the COVID crisis when because of uncertainty and fear, markets were starting to break. And they moved in and the markets closed and settled and worked. And you know, the end result is the Fed balance sheet is, is a lot larger. But we didn't have a financial crisis. We don't have a financial crisis. Recovering from this health crisis is very different than recovering from a financial crisis would be. You're not seeing the kind of drying up of capital. Um, yet you're seeing a, a, a slow resumption of normal activity, but there's every expectation that there will be capital there to fund business activity uh, as we go forward. In terms of the size of the deficit, uh, I, um, I don't think there's a number that um, is kind of an objective measure. You know, one, one way to look at the, what the government can afford is the cost of servicing the debt. With interest rates so low, the cost of servicing the debt has actually gone down as a percentage of GDP, even though the amounts of debt have gone up. Now, you can ask, what happens if rates spike up? Well, if rates spike up, you know, it takes years for that to flow through because the average weighted uh, maturity is getting longer, not shorter right now. So again, there's time to respond. I suspect you'd see a change in fiscal policy that would also have to be factored in were you to see that kind of a trend. Had we not seen an aggressive use of fiscal tools in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, we wouldn't be talking about the healthy recovery that we're looking at. And um, I think the differential between countries is in part how much fiscal space they had to support monetary policy and also how effective they've been getting their hands around the health crisis. Because if you don't get your hands around the health crisis, the need for extraordinary policy grows instead of shrinks. And it's a global recovery being led really by the United States and China 
with Europe a little behind. Um, and um, I worry that as we get to the emerging markets and the, you know, we're seeing in India, the, the terrible uh, rampage of COVID in India, that's not the last story like this, sadly, that I suspect we'll see. There's going to be much longer term damage in economies and countries that don't have the fiscal and monetary tools or the health tools that we have. And that's going to require, I think, ongoing intervention. Fair enough. And, and when you talk about the time it takes for interest rates to ripple through economies and to show up with long term effects, I think there's a, a similar condition as it relates to labor. And you touched earlier on the skills of our labor force uh, and their adequacy and appropriateness to meet the demand uh, where it exists for labor and where it's growing rapidly. And I would think another factor there is the mobility of labor. That's something we saw in the great financial crisis where a lot of people couldn't go where the jobs were because they couldn't sell the house that they owned in the place where the jobs weren't. Do you see that as, is better or worse or about the same today as it was 10 years ago? Well, we're not seeing a crisis in the, in the residential real estate market. Values are up, um, properties are selling quickly, credit is still available. So it's a very different phenomenon. We are at a time when there are other things that are impeding uh, the ability of labor to get back uh, to work. If your kids are not in school, um, your ability to go back to work is different than if your kids are in school. So as kids are going back to school, that frees people up. You know, we've seen new patterns develop in terms of how care is provided between generations. Um, we're going to have to kind of see how that plays through. It, it, if, if people have come to the view that taking care of, you know, elder relatives at home is the right way to go, that affects who can go back into the labor force as well. I mean, we're going to need to be very attentive to um, what changes of preference are coming out of COVID because it's been a, a 13 month period when some changes have happened that will have lingering impact. And some of it will improve uh, economic and, and, and living standards some of it will will create new challenges to navigate. Um, you know, certainly uh, the going back to school is something everyone will celebrate, uh, from the kids to the parents. Uh, I, I, I I've had grandkids around some during COVID, and you know I, I understand that the joys of Zoom bombing are short lived, uh, and and people will be happy when the kids are in school and they're at their offices. I think you're right. So you touched on something just now when you're talking about housing and how housing values have been quite robust. Certainly low interest rates have supported the ongoing growth in housing values. And the other thing that is very, very distinctly different today from where we were in say 07, 08, 09, is the supply of houses is not in excess. It's rather the other extreme. It's in shortage, which is helping drive prices. And if you take that analog and move it over to the securities markets for a minute, there are fewer publicly traded companies today than there were not so many years ago. Interest rates are low, discouraging capital being in fixed income assets versus assets with more growth potential, particularly if they're dividend paying assets. And if there's potential inflation on the horizon, that too might draw capital, whether it's individual or institutional, more in the direction of equities than fixed income. Do you think that the interest rate environment and the, I won't, I would not use the term suppression, but others would, uh, potentially the very persistent uh, stimulative environment has created a bubble in, in either financial or real assets. So there's no question, but that um, a sustained period of very low interest rates, zero boundary interest rates has had an effect on asset value. And it, it, um, you know, it, 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 the risk has not been priced in the way it would have been if the alternate interest rates uh, were, were at a level that is more uh, traditional. Um, now, does that mean there are bubbles that will burst? 
there certainly are investments that will turn out not to have been good investments. That's true in any interest rate environment. Um, and when more risk is being taken, there's more chance of that. I look at the publicly traded markets um, and they do seem to be overall uh, a bit frothy, but it's not equal across all of the different sectors. You know, technology that's been integral to dealing with this uh, COVID crisis is through the roof. Other more traditional assets have been uh, lagging behind. It's very much a question of, of what asset you're talking about, not just the market overall. You know, my own view, and you and I have talked about this, you know, if, if one's talking about their own personal retirement, you know, I keep my money in, in broad market-based funds because I believe in the U.S. economy in the long term. I don't particularly believe in my ability, you know, as a stock investor to necessarily uh, get the timing or the trends all right. I still think that's true about the overall economy. You know, obviously, this is a moment when valuations on average are a little high, and that's something people have to be aware of. But the long-term trend, there'll be winners and losers. You know, in, in our investment business, you know, we don't uh, just look to what the market is saying now. We look at the fundamentals. You know, we only buy businesses if we have a thesis for how we can run it to have a, a stronger future than when we, we, we are acquiring it. And we don't, we don't look to kind of external factors because we, you know, with our best efforts, we can't know what all the external factors will be because nobody can. But you can look where there are inefficiencies, where there are potentials to grow a market, where there is a permanent need. And we're pretty conservative. So in my private and in my investing life, I'm pretty conservative on my investments. I think people have been going into things that um, are of questionable long-term value. Um, and that's always a risky business. Um, you know, so, um, you know, I, I, I think people and institutions have to uh, uh, kind of take stock of their own real risk tolerance and, um, and invest uh, in a way that's consistent with that. Makes sense, makes sense. And again, you have to always answer the question, if you're thinking about changing what you're doing with your personal portfolio, or if you manage money for others with, with that institutional money, what's the, what's the or else? If not this, then what? And that's a tough one to answer right now. So right, though, though even even in this environment, you know, when 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 you're looking at companies that you think are um, overvalued or valued so highly that you won't be able to necessarily um, exit uh, in a way that uh, you would like, you have to underwrite conservatively. You have to assume you might have to exit at a lower multiple, not a higher multiple. And when you look at how much debt you take on. Um, you have to ask the question, are you going to have the ability to stay there through a bump in the road? So, you know, there's different strategies of investing and different, different kinds of risk. Um, and uh, I, think, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's hard to deliver the kinds of returns that funds like yours appropriately need to meet their obligations. And, um, you know, it, 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 there are different kinds of risks one can take. Um, my own preference is, uh, is for the things that you have more control over. <laughs> Understood. We have a few more minutes left, so let's, let's leg into two other areas that I think will probably be of interest. Um, we have currently uh, moving in Congress an infrastructure program that the president has come forward with. Infrastructure has been a subject of a lot of discussion over the past several presidencies. And I don't think there's any question that there's a real need uh, for the U.S. to upgrade its infrastructure. There is some haggling at the margins over what infrastructure includes, but I'd be curious as to your view of the value of uh, infrastructure spending to the productivity and competitiveness of our economy and, and how that will relate to our ongoing recovery. You know, Ash, I don't think there's any question, but that if we want to have uh, an economic future that is as good as our economic past, we have to invest in our infrastructure. Um, I've believed that for a very long time. Um, 
In fact, when I was at the Treasury Department, one of the places I went to try and draw attention to it was the Port of Miami, because it's such a fabulous seaport, uh, we need more of those. We need to have the ability to have goods and services come and go in a way that meets the needs of the modern economy. And um, you know, it's airports, it's seaports, it's the technology uh, uh, highways that uh, we know for our personal and business lives are key to our being able to function. And that takes investment. Much of it is public investment. Um, I think the in, in a highly polarized country, we can get almost universal agreement that we should have better highways and ports and airports. Nobody likes getting stuck in traffic or uh, in an airport where there's no, uh, no uh, uh, air bridge available for 20 minutes while you're sitting on the ground. We all, we all know that it's inefficient, it's frustrating, um, and people deal with it every day. The question is how to pay for it. Um, and you know, there will be some debate over whether we should pay for it. You know, my own view is that you should save your fiscal space for when you have the economic need to run deficits, and you should try and maintain a sustainable fiscal path when the economy is doing well. So there may be a case for a little bit of deficit spending for the last stage of the economic recovery. But as we go forward, uh, we, that, that's not a path that we should stay on. You ask how big the deficit should be. To me, the question is, at what point do you go back to caring about uh, adding to the deficit? And the answer is when the economy is back on its feet. Um, and you shouldn't quickly go to reduce it because you don't want to cause a rebound of an economic crisis, but you ought to start stop adding to the pile of debt. So then the question is, how do you pay for it? And for a very long time, we've had a challenge getting to a consensus. You know, for our highways, where you know we have a gasoline tax that hasn't been raised uh, for a generation, and um, we've got to now be attendant to the fact that a gasoline tax won't cover the vehicle miles traveled by electric vehicles. So there's going to be a need to modernize how you think about even the motor vehicle tax. Um, but that's a drop in the bucket in terms of funding our infrastructure needs. You know, at some point, one has to raise revenue uh, to pay for an investment program. And I think we're about to have a pretty, uh, a pretty fulsome debate over what the demand for infrastructure investment is and what the willingness to pay for it is. Um, you know, I'm happy to offer views on some of the individual proposals, but to me, the kind of theoretical question is, are we willing to do some hard things to pay for the infrastructure we need? I hope the answer is yes, because if we want to compete with China, if we want to compete with emerging economies, we can't let our infrastructure crumble. Uh, the things that have drawn investment to the United States and have made the United States economy so vibrant is the quality of our people, the quality of our markets, and the quality of our infrastructure. And I would add the quality of our system, the fact that it, the rule of law is something people have relied on. We have to watch all of those things because that is our national treasure. Couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. And the other element is that it's one of the few areas where you can spend money that you not only stimulate the economy by employing Americans, and by extension, making sure they have skills that are worthy in the marketplace to put them to work, but you're also creating long-lived assets that will benefit generations of, of Americans yet unborn. So to me, it's just an unambiguous winner, but it's been a tough one for Congress to get its head around because everybody gets hung up on exactly the key question you just addressed, which is how should we pay for this? Is it a user pay model? Is it a debt model? Is it a general taxation model? And that's just a political discussion that needs to evolve and be solved. And, and that's why you have a deliberative body in Congress. And, and in the end, the numbers are large enough that it's not one answer. Um, you probably need a user model. You probably need a general taxation. And, um, you know, it, it, at the right moments, debt is not, a, is not the wrong thing to do. But it can't be the whole answer. It, 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 I mean, we're not going to get the infrastructure we need if uh, if it all has to be put on a credit card. 
it's also not entirely a federal issue. I think of the states as laboratories of, the, of democracy around the country. And I know here in Florida right now, our legislature is in session. And one of the policy uh, initiatives that's in, under contemplation is whether people who own electric cars pay additional fees for their registration. And in return for those additional fees, the state would fund uh, building a much larger number of high speed charging stations on major routes around Florida. I think for us, with the number of people we have coming to Florida for vacations and tourism, accommodating electric cars makes a lot of sense and it's a, it's a distinguishing factor that would be good for us in any number of ways. And that's a classic example of something that has nothing to do with federal spending. It's a state initiative that for our own interests uh, has been proposed and it's under consideration now. Whether it passes or not is another matter, but it's an illustration. And I suspect some of these issues will come together. I mean, we saw in Texas the need for us to harden some of our electric infrastructure just to deal with the stresses that um, are predictably not one-off events. We don't know when they'll hit and where they'll hit. Well, while you're hardening your system is the time to think about how do you modernize it to meet the needs of the future, not to just address uh, what they were designed to meet when they were put in place 50 years ago. Right. So let's kind of come back to the core theme of what we're talking about, which is COVID and the post-COVID post world. Let's, uh, having, having assessed the domestic environment pretty thoroughly, let's go on the road for a little bit and compare where the U.S. is in terms of the war on the uh, COVID-19 virus and the success of our um, vaccination program. Let's compare ourselves with Europe and let's talk about the European economy for a little bit and relative competitiveness there, relative challenges, opportunities for them, particularly in a post-Brexit environment. And then after flogging that for a little bit, if we still have some time, let's go to, go to Asia and China in particular. Sure. Look, I, I think um, the least common denominator is the getting the countries getting its hands around the health crisis has been key to getting its economy moving again. And um, it didn't work to ignore uh, COVID in any place where that was the strategy. And until we had a vaccine, um, it took the extraordinary kinds of measures like shutdowns and, and, and uh, uh, real remote uh, conditions uh, in order to prevent the spread. So I think the United States has gone through different phases. I think right now we're kind of at the lead in terms of vaccination, uh, and therefore we have every reason to believe our economy is going to be uh, one of the drivers of global growth in the next year. Um, you know, we don't have a guarantee of that. We don't know that there won't be variations coming from other countries and even domestically. Uh, so I don't think anyone should be cocky that this is completely behind us. But we're poised now, if we continue to get vaccinated, um, to really show the way. Um, I say if because we're about 50% vaccinated and there's a goodly number of people who are not vaccinated who may or may not be uh, choosing uh, to take advantage of it. Um, that's, that's a challenge because until we get to, I'm not a scientist, but uh, until we get to like 80% uh, vaccination, you don't have herd immunity. So we're still a ways away. Hopefully that's going to fall into place and we'll be okay. Europe um, you know, did it reasonably well responding economically. I would say they get higher marks than Europe has gotten for dealing with things collectively in terms of monetary and fiscal measures. Um, they had different practices in different countries on how to manage uh, the, the shutdown and, 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 and the precautionary moves. Um, that had an effect on, on what the infection rates were and, and what the kind of long-term economic impact were, but really the vaccination issue is now what's distinguishing. I mean, the UK, which you didn't do great on the prevention side early on, is ahead of Europe on vaccinations. Europe is just catching up. Um, we, if Europe can catch up on the vaccination, they're poised uh, to have a reasonably strong economy. But if you go over to Asia, um, several Asian countries that didn't have um, uh, 
a very substantial outbreak at the beginning, also had, um, uh, for cultural reasons, both in terms of the acceptance of masking after SARS, but also because of the willingness to follow rules for one reason or another, a lower infection rate. Uh, they're actually, because they're behind us in vaccination, somewhat more at risk now of, of having more health problems. You know, China is ahead of many other countries in Asia, both in terms of having limited the spread after an initial period of denial, they kind of shut things down and, and, and they do have their own vaccines, which even if they're not as effective as ours, are widely available. I think, you know, when you look at the kind of leaders of economic growth, the United States, China, and Europe are where the growth for the global economy seems to be coming from. I do worry when you look at large countries, large economies like India, that haven't seen the worst of this yet, um, both suffering enormous human tragedy, but also an economic loss um, that isn't just within their borders. It becomes a loss to the global economy. So I don't think we're done with this crisis uh, globally. Um, and I certainly hope that we're able in the United States to not see another round of it and to be the leaders uh, to show how you get out of it. And going beyond the crisis, uh, the COVID crisis, when we think about China and we think about China's assertion of itself around the world, um, it's just been more assertive of its presence and shifting perceptions of its role on the planet and potentially challenged, challenging the United States for global superpower leadership. How do you see the 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 potential for cooperation between these two competitors uh, at, a, at, a, at a major global level, frenemies, if you will. How do you yeah. see that unfolding and finding alignment, the potential for finding alignment? So look, I think the US-China relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world. We're the two largest economies, the two most powerful countries, very different values and systems and differences on so many things. Um, it is not a good thing for either the United States or China or for the world if we're on a path of inevitable conflict. On the other hand, we're not going to ever um, step back from criticizing if China does things that are either unfair economically or wrong in terms of human rights. And um, that's creating a, a tension geopolitically as China you know, reaches out uh, to make itself more of a presence that raises increasing risks of bumping into each other physically as well as verbally. So I think that there's, it's essential for the relationship um, to be one where we look for the areas where we have common interests, and that could be on issues ranging from the multilateral threats like climate change or dealing with Iran's uh, nuclear program there's a host of issues where we have interests that overlap, at least in part. Um, there's bilateral issues where if we engage, we can actually make progress. Uh, progress doesn't mean making China into the United States. They're going to be China and we're going to be the United States and we're going to be in places where we disagree with each other. But you know, if we can have the areas where we can compete, and we have the areas where we can collaborate, it's okay to have issues that we fundamentally disagree on where we have antagonistic views. The challenge is how that doesn't spill over into becoming the kind of hostile relationship that leads to economic and geopolitical instability. So I don't believe that decoupling our economies is a solution, even though we have to have the ability to you know, withstand a cutoff of certain things from China as they have to be able to withstand a cutoff of certain things from us. It's not a black and white either or. And I think when you talk about complete separation, you're really also talking about inevitable conflict. And that that's not the, the best outcome. It's a, it's, it's a challenging, challenging relationship. I spend a fair amount of time uh, thinking about these issues and working on them. Um, and, you know, I, I hope we're in a period 
where uh, we can find a way to manage all three different dimensions of the relationship because conflict alone um, is a very dangerous path. Agreed. So we're almost out of time. I'm, I'm going to toss in one other question that came up from, from the audience and, and spin it a little bit contextually. So as an individual whose name and signature were on United States currency for a number of years, which is a, a very special thing, that must be pretty cool to pick up a U.S. Uh, note and see your own signature on it. Uh, what do you think of alternative currencies, notably cryptocurrencies? So I think cryptocurrencies are fascinating and I dealt with them considerably when I was at Treasury because they were emerging uh, at that time. You know, um, I think the issues that we identified then are still the issues now and they're yet to be fully uh, resolved. Um, is a currency that's not backed by a sovereign money? My own view is it's not. In the end, um, it may have enormous increases in value but can also go away someday um, if something new comes along that becomes more popular. So I think you have to distinguish between sovereign and non-sovereign. Um, I think the idea of sovereign um, cryptocurrency in some ways is no more than um, a different medium for paper currency. I mean, if the you know, People's Bank of China issues uh, crypto renminbi, any pension or foreign reserve that's deciding to keep its cash in that cryptocurrency will ask the same questions they ask of the paper currency. Is there full uh, convertibility? Can I get it when I need it? Is it going to be subject to political uh, you know, interruptions of any kind? Now, you can't solve that by going from paper to crypto. That's systemic. So I actually don't think that the development of a cryptocurrency addresses that fundamental question of saying, are you ready to be the world's reserve currency? As a means of settlement, it's a real issue. And as a means of settlement, um, I do think we have to keep our eye on what the options are. And I know the Fed is looking at when the United States should be in that space. It's not a great thing if just as a settlement um, mechanism, all of the information about a country is controlled by another country. That gives you insight that's of real strategic value, um, even an economic value. So, you know, I don't think we should assume that you know, that, that the you know, sovereign cryptocurrencies aren't going to become more of a thing of the future. And I don't think we should be afraid of them either. Um, I think as long as the dollar is the safe haven, as long as the dollar is the definition of zero risk, you know, it's a technological question whether we want to be in that space. And it's not an imminent risk of replacing a normal currency uh, for settlement, but I do think that it's the kind of thing that we should continue to look at. Um, you know, I'm, as an investment, when people, you know, ask, you know, should, should a, a diversified fund be in cryptocurrencies, you know, I'm, I'm not of the view that private uh, uh, you know, cryptocurrency is a safe way to store value for the long term. And um, you have to be willing for it to go down as quickly as it went up. Well, the other thing is there's, there's no limit on the number of cryptocurrencies that can be created. And in my own experience as an investor is that when you have things that are opaque, black boxes, that are undefined, that go up and up in value and draw a following because they go up in value, those things are often great until they're not. Until and they're, not. they're not. It, the Bernie Madoff matter comes to mind. He died recently. That was something when I was in New York, I had a lot of clients who would rib me when we had a down month and say, why can't you be like Bernie and go up every month? And my answer was always, I don't know what Bernie's got going on, but that just doesn't feel right or durable to me. We'll see. We can tell you why we went up and why we went down. He won't. We'll see where this all goes. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. And, you know, whether it's uh, an investment scheme or tulips, um, you know, if something becomes a fad and it's too good to be true, you know, it, to me, it's not it's not something of enduring value. Um, now, I could be wrong. It could be that maybe this is the exception to the rule. But over time, you know, these kinds of bubbles 
tend to not last. And well, if somebody else can design a new cryptocurrency tomorrow, and that could become you know the 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 new hot uh, alternative. And I think if these sovereign-backed cryptocurrencies emerge, um, they're going to dominate ultimately in terms of the global economic impact. And uh, you know the speed of settlement is it, so fast with traditional currency being processed through electronic uh, technology that I, for one, don't see the the speed differential as being a driver. Um, you know, it's interesting when we looked at cryptocurrency initially, the attraction of it, you know, was anonymous transactions. Well, that to somebody who worries about, um, you know, threat finance and, and money laundering, anonymous transactions that are hard to trace is not very attractive. But ironically, cryptocurrencies actually have a repository of digital fingerprints that is greater than uh, than cash currency. And wow. it depends how you use the medium, not what the medium itself is. Well, and for those who are just itching to invest in the area, I would offer this idea. You don't have to pick individual crypto units to invest in. You can invest in, in companies that provide platforms for trading and valuing and executing these currencies and do it that way. Well, we're, we've run out of time. I want to Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Secretary. It's wonderful as always. Your wisdom is always delightful to uh, partake of. You're generous to share it with us. Thank you. Good to be with you, Ash. You've been listening to Jacob Liu, former U.S. Treasury Secretary and a managing partner with Lindsey Goldberg, speaking before the Economic Club of Florida on April 27, 2021. For more information on the Lindsey Goldberg firm, visit LindsayGoldbergLLC.com. The Economic Club of Florida promotes interest and enlightenment on important economic, political, and social issues of the day. To learn more, including how to become a member, visit our website at economic-club.com.